and God and slays those people who are actually committing idolatry. Those who set themselves apart from the world and join themselves to the world. That's what Levi means. And later on, they became the ministers who were musicians and singers and gatekeepers and so on and so on and actually ministered to the Lord, set themselves apart. The Gentiles, sons of foreigners who joined themselves to the Lord like that, Usually that you find them in the house of prayer at the moment. Those who want to be contrite and broken. So that they will be a vessel. They will have, God will have a messenger who is the message. Remember we talked about Malachi 2.7 today. Malachi, the priest, should have the word of God on their lips. Because they are the messenger <coughs> of God. Yeah. The Levites. This is the kind of people that God is looking for. Who do not join themselves. Then, what's the next word? To minister to Him. Those who join themselves, like the Levites who actually minister to the Lord night and day, 24-7. Those who completely detach from the world and attach themselves to the Lord and ministers to Him. Those who love the name of the Lord, what does that mean? What I talked about yesterday. The first commandment. Mm -hmm. Love the Lord with all their heart and mind and soul and nothing else. Mm. It's like Nazarites. We really need Nazarites mm -hmm. to raise up. And then he says to be his servant. You know why you have to love him first? To be his servant. You know in uh, Matthew 25 he talks about the talent. And later on when, uh, <laughs> when the judgment came... What does God say? What does He say? Welcome. Come into my joy. They already know the joy. Come to into my joy. What do you say? To what and what servant? Good and faithful. Not just faithful servant. What does good mean? Like God. Hmm? Like God. Like God. In what sense? So when God created the world, He says, first day. Light was good. What does that mean? It's ontological. <laughs> ontological. Very good. That word. How did you learn that word? <laughs> it's not epistemological. It's ontological, right? The way he is. It's a being thing. Yeah. But um, what was I saying? You interrupted me. God is good. God is good. What does it mean when God said it was good after he created something? It means this. It was exactly the way I thought about it. Exactly how I wanted it, it became. God, a good, means what God said is good. Not what we define it to be good. When He says, this is the way I want it, that's good. Does that make sense or not? When He says it's good, it means it's exactly the way I see it and planned it when He created the world. So it was good. So when he says good and faithful, people actually are very diligent in the church generally. But they're not necessarily good. We're not talking about human goodness. I'm talking about it's in a line with God. Are you doing what God has been doing? What God wants you to do? We are not a religious institute. Okay? It's like this. If you are a servant and if you are blind and deaf... You might be diligent and faithful. You might be. The master says, go and prepare dinner because there are ten guests coming tonight. You're deaf and blind. You're sweeping the floor. <laughs> you're cleaning the house. You're, doing, you're building the walls. And night comes. Ten guests rock up. What have you done? That could be us. In the judgment day. I told you to do this. I didn't ask you to do that. What if he does that? Something to think about, hey? And then he said, verse 7, then verse 7 comes and says, these ones, them, these ones, I will bring them into my holy mountain. Do you know, it actually literally, it's a, I think it's hifal, which in the Hebrew means that I will cause them to come. 
That's what literally means. I will cause them. It's not, I'm going to just take them. I'm going to cause them to come. I'm going to move them to come. And he says, I will cause them to rejoice. It, it doesn't just give, he's not going to, just because you come to house of prayer, just going to give you joy. That's not what he's saying. What does it say? He says in NIV, uh, I will, uh, where is it? Sorry. I will, uh, I will bring them to my holy mountain and give them joy. You know, yeah, I will cause them to rejoice. Why would you cause them to be full of joy in the house of prayer? Hallelujah. Why? Because of God. His presence. He's not just going to throw joy to people. He's actually going to cause you to be full of joy. Because I am there. That's how it works. So the, when people say the joyful prayer, it doesn't just mean joyful prayer. It means you pray out of your joy of encountering God. So this is the kind of people, do you want to be invited into this thing, whenever that could be? I think this is, the fulfillment of this is will be Millennium Kingdom. But anyway, that's, if you read Ezekiel, uh, chapter 40 onwards, it talks about an Ezekiel temple, and a temple that is as big as Jerusalem in itself. It has never been built before, and I don't think it will happen before Antichrist comes. It will have to be in the Millennium Kingdom. Okay, well, that's a whole another story for that time. <laughs> So this is what we're talking about. Are you, are you actually excited about yes. joining that? Amen. 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 This is what I'm talking about. Okay. So let's go to Mary of Bethany because he, she is the perfect example of this. Thing. Luke 10. Mm. But, um, are, are people on board here? Are, are, are people understanding? Yes. yes. <coughs> Luke 10. <coughs> As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, it's 36, sorry, uh, 38, sorry. Uh, this is where you know, uh, Jesus gets invited to Mary, Mary and Martha's uh, house. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened a home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all all the preparation that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work, of, work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. <coughs> Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. What kind of a woman is Martha? And I am totally not um, trying to put Martha down here at all. Jesus loved her. I loved her, and uh, she loved Jesus. Okay. She's a task-oriented person. Yeah, no, no, before that, just let's go. <coughs> when you actually uh, ask questions, look at the Bible. <coughs> Answer what it says there. Okay? I know you, so I'm not rebuking you. Just It's, it's important <laughs> that we actually hospitable. do that. Very hospitable. Excellent answer. That's exactly what she is. Look, she hardly knows these people, and he, she invites all these people, hospitable. What else? What kind of woman is Martha? Opens a home. Welcome. Generous. Martha is hospitable. This is the character of Martha. Perfect deacon of the church. Women deacon of the church. Isn't it? Perfect, almost. Servant-like. Yeah? And she had a sister called Mary who <coughs> sat at the Lord's feet listening, feet, listening to what he said. Let me just come back to this. But Martha, let's go, let's go back. Yeah, let's go. 39. She had a, called Mary. <coughs> at that time in that culture, for Mary to sit at someone's man's feet, a young man's feet, and listening to him while her elder sister is slaving away in the kitchen amongst the men, okay? What kind of person do you have to be to be sitting at the feet of Jesus? You have to totally ignore the culture at the time. And there will be, all men will be gazing at, at her, saying, what the heck are you doing here? 
breaking every kind of cultural rule and tradition to sit at the feet of Jesus. Mm. That is required right now. Mm. No matter what other people say, if this is the one thing, we talked about one thing this morning, Psalm 27, 4, you have to remember that. One thing that I seek, one thing that I desire is to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire of in His temple. That one thing. If that is what God desires for you, that's what is required of you. And are you willing to do that even when your parents and your brothers and your brothers and sisters in the church, when your <coughs> leaders, your pastor says, whatever they say, I'm going to fit, sit at the feet of Jesus. Because that's the kind of person you'll see later on that will move God's heart. Mm. And that goes against the grain. I understand. But that is what has always been required in the history of time. Those who were going to be separated out by God. And let's go back to Martha, 40. But Martha was distracted from all uh, all the preparation. That word distracted means what she was, what she should have been doing, she has been taken away from. That's what, literally what it means. So in other words, just distracted. That's exactly what it means. She was distracted by all the preparation that had to be made, and she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. There has been never anyone who spoke to Jesus like this. <laughs> Martha was bold. <laughs> Jesus, don't you care about me? Help, ask her to help me. <laughs> Martha's bold. I like her. You know, I like her. Uh, I'm sure Martha became like Mary later. Okay, that's what I think. Martha was bold, and no one spoke to Jesus like that. Okay. It shows that how friendly. Well, how close they probably were. Mm -hmm. mm. And so Jesus replied, Martha, Martha. Why twice? Anybody know? Emphasis, Emphasis exactly. In Hebrew, there's no word called very. <coughs> so when I said, you are very good, right? They don't have that word, so they have to say, good, good. You are good, good. Do you know that? You're very Martha. <laughs> Martha, Martha means, Martha, you need to listen to what I have to say. Okay, you know how we sang that word, holy, holy, holy? Thrice? You, in Hebrew, you never call anybody or anything thrice. Only God. Mm. So holy, holy, holy is actually, there is no holy person like him. You only use it three times to God. Okay, that's what it means. There's no, it's like not doesn't mean very very good or very very old. It means that's God. Mm. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So Martha, Martha, twice. The Lord answered, "You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed." And Martha has chosen. Yeah. Mary. Oh, sorry, Mary. <laughs> Mary has chosen what is better. What is the one thing, and that will be never taken away from her. He says, never. Why? Because remember, I'm, gonna, I'm going ahead a little bit later on, when uh, she, she actually anoints Jesus, right? What does Jesus say? Wherever the gospel is preached, this story will be told. What would you do to actually be spoken to like that by Jesus, by God himself? He never said anything like that to disciples. Disciple had no idea. <coughs> Blind until Holy Spirit came. Mary, there aren't many people, many people in the Bible, in the, while Jesus was alive, who worshipped Jesus like that. None. Simple woman in Luke 7, they could be Mary and all. There's hardly anybody who worshipped Jesus like that. Mm. Okay. I'll, I'll, come back, I'll come back to that. Okay. So this is where she learns the posture. That's what I want to say here. Okay? And you'll see the product of this. This is where uh, she actually learned. This is called wilderness. Wilderness is when, not when you're just suffering. Okay? Wilderness is when there is no one else but you and God. Mm -hmm. So you have to fully depend on God. I'm not talking about living things. That's part of it. 
But when you really have one on one, okay? when you have want to have close relationship with uh, people, what is the most important thing? What is it? Time. So why do you think you can be intimate without time? <laughs> intimacy. The depth of your intimacy. I'm gonna. Anybody who's a mathematician or likes math, mathematics is proportional. You know this to time. That's the equation. Intimacy, prophecy, without intimacy, is clairvoyancy. That's how it works. <clears throat> so that's Luke 10. Let's go to John 11. What is, what's John 11 famous for? Resurrection of Lazarus. Mm. Alright. Well, we'll make a good time. So I'm going to go verse by verse and just go through it. And I'll show you what kind of person Mary has become because of she was sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters <coughs> sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Okay. So Lazarus is sick, he's going to die, and he's sick, on, and he's sick uh, in bed, and he, they send uh, a person, a messenger, to actually tell Jesus that he is sick. What are they expecting? Jesus to come and heal them. Yes. Okay, good. When he heard this, when Jesus heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that the God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. And then what's the next conjunction word in your Bible? Therefore. Yeah? Anybody else? And yet. And yet. That's different, isn't it? And yet and therefore is different. Completely different. Right? Anybody else? Yeah? All right. Either it's but or therefore. Or but or so. Okay, they're different. Completely contrast. So let's say, therefore, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. <coughs> There's a lot in there, okay? People translate into yet because it makes sense that if he loved them or loved Lazarus, he should have been gone straight away. So they translate it as but. But Greek, it's not but. It's actually therefore. So. So this is how it goes. Jesus loved Lazarus and Mary and Martha so much that he stayed back mm -hmm. two more days. Yep. How is that possible? Bigger glory. Well, that's an easy answer. Of course, it's for glory of God. Yeah. How? How is that? How? Tell me how you how he, that that's possible that that he actually loved him so <coughs> loved them so much that he stayed back. There's something that he wants to teach them. That's right. But there's more than that. It's the... Yes. All right. Let's, let's have a look at it. Very okay. dead. Completely dead. Yeah. Completely dead. Good. Yeah. Let me explain. And let's have a look at Jesus. Okay. Verse 4. This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Two things. What is two things that he wants to achieve? To be glory of God. For God to be glorified and yep. him also to be glorified through it. Yeah, but what's the what's the, the two things that he he's, he's saying? Right? First sentence. I am the resurrection and the life. No, no. Look, this sickness will not end there. Okay. <laughs> Straight out of the Bible, please. All right. So this sickness will not end there. Okay. That's that's not. He's not going to die. Right. That's what he's saying. And then what? Then I will be glorified. God will be glorified and I will be glorified. Mm. God will glorify me. Those two things. When God proclaims these things, what is, what kind of, what is that? <coughs> when 
Jesus proclaims this. What is he doing? What is he saying? Prophesying. He's prophesying. This is whole thing is prophecy of God. Do you understand? Yeah. Yeah. He's prophesying. Once God proclaims, do you know what he does next? It's always the same. He fulfills them. He does. But he does something else before that. His eyes go to and fro looking for people. He looks for the person or people who will fulfill the words of God through. He's looking for people who will actually be ready for that word to be fulfilled through. Mm. It's not them actually who will actually do it. Because later on Jesus will resurrect them. Is that true? Jesus resurrects Lazarus. It's not Mary. Mm. But he's looking for people who actually, that he will work through. Who will position themselves and posture themselves to work through. Just like 1 Chronicles 16, uh, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. He's looking for people. So he's looking for people who will actually proclaim those things into reality, who will partner with him. The reason why is this. Because when God created the world, he gave authority okay, to the man, mankind, to manage everything in the, in the world. He, they lost it in, 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 by Satan, to Satan, and then Jesus got it back in authority of Jesus. So God will always look for a partner who will actually fulfill the very word that he proclaims. Does that make sense? So let's have a look at who, who he's looking for. The first kind of pe who first person people are his disciples. <coughs> I haven't actually dealt with that. Uh, so hey, I'll, I'll come back to you. Come back to that. Again, the Jews pick. Oh, this. What am I doing? Yeah. Verse seven. Then he said to his disciples, 